being a successful artist is a game of archery, okay? It is how many arrows you fire. And one of the primary reasons that I see artists and photographers fail is they create what they like, what makes them happy, what inspires them, and then they go and take that product to the market and it doesn't sell. And then they immediately either blame the market, uh, say art is not selling, uh, they're like, I'm not good enough, uh, uh, whatever it is, I should have listened to my dad, this will only be a hobby. It just means what you created that particular time is not resonating with your, with your audience. It doesn't mean you're a crappy artist, doesn't mean you need to hang things up. It just means you have to contemplate, you have to always understand that the work must go out into the world, okay? The work needs to sell. And Picasso is just the perfect example of this. It's why the book is just so incredible. The next point, and this is where we start getting into pricing. You need a range of pricing, okay? Succinctly, succinctly, and I'll get into this in the bullet points, you need items priced from zero to $100. You need items priced from 100 to 1,000. And then you need prices over $1,000. You just do. And the reason that you do is this bell curve right here, okay? What I like to call the socioeconomic bell curve. It doesn't matter who you are on this call. You're going out into the world. You're marketing your art. You're exhibiting at a fair and show. You're in a gallery. The folks that are going to get drawn into your ecosystem fall somewhere on this socioeconomic bell curve, okay? And at the low end of the scale, there's the low so so socioeconomic folks. You know, they, they, they don't have a ton of dispensable income right now, but they, they love what you do, and, and, and you need to understand that. And then you have lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class, and then you have the high net worth individuals. When you understand you're operating a business, you realize that if you don't have prices for everyone on that bell curve, you are missing sales every single solitary time you do anything. You're exhibiting at a show, you're in a gallery, you're wherever you are, you are missing out on sales. And what no one understands about this business or what very few understand is you guys are creatives. You, are, you, you can't turn this off. This is how you were made. You know, whether you believe in God or not, this is how God made you, this is how the universe made you, whatever. You're a creative, it's never gonna change. You're gonna be at this business for the rest of your lives, okay? And that socioeconomic bell curve is not fixed. People go up and down this thing at various different stages of their life throughout their career. So as you acquire people into your ecosystem, the people that are on the lower end of the socioeconomic bell curve now and are living in their mother's basement and buy something that you have priced under $100 that then sits on their wall for the next 10 years and then they buy a two-story house that completely needs to be outfitted with art, the artist that makes that sale is the one that understood this bell curve. The artist that makes that sale is the one that's had something under $100 that they sold that they made very little money on. Why would I waste my time with that? And now all of a sudden that artist is top of mind. The new house is purchased. All that wall space opens up. And the artist that sold that cheaper item is now the one that is getting those sales. And this is just a fact of business. And it's a fact of business very, very few people understand. And I look at this, this socioeconomic bell curve, and I'm so insanely passionate about it. And I realize, like, you know, at a high level, at a high level, what most of you guys are sold is the dream of being in an art gallery and all of your pieces start at 1,000 and they go to 10,000 and 25,000 and the gallery handles everything and you don't have to do anything else except just show up occasionally and they handle all the marketing and everything else. Do you know what the odds of making it in that world is? They're not good. It's slightly better than buying a lottery ticket, okay? I have been doing this, having these webinars like this and talking to artists and photographers hundreds a week for two years now. I would say out of the, hun at, let, let's just take a, a, a mathematical pull out of that. Of all the people that have come in these webinars, maybe, maybe two and a half out of 100 are making over six figures a year in the gallery model, are making over six figures a year with an art business that, that just has high-end pieces and is doing it well. Those are not good odds. That's like saying I'm a basketball player and I'm gonna make it to the NBA or I'm a baseball player and I'm gonna make it to the MLB. Everyone else, if they understand, my arms are reversed, that socioeconomic bell curve and they work towards getting prices, okay, to, to for each step of that game, you end up winning. This is just a mathematical formula. It's just maths, okay? And I want to get into more of the specifics, but understand, under, understand this is your ballgame. 
And, you know, w one of the other things that I love that I get all the time, which is utter, total, and complete bullshit, is everyone telling me, I just want to market to the high net worth individuals. I just want to get that list of high-end collectors that will purchase my stuff. I know I can just be successful if I just target these upper-class folks. Okay. Every business in the world, aside from the 99-cent stores, wants to target those people in the upper class. You think that's a non-competitive landscape that you with little marketing experience is going to dominate? No, you're not. The odds are not good at that. So you need to take this thing seriously. And when you do, you're setting yourself up for a much higher level of success. So now that we talk about the range of pricing, okay, we know what it is. And I would argue, going back to this thing, the low end of the scale is important and the high end of the scale is important too. If you're someone that prices your originals at $5,000, I'd like to see something in your lineup for $25,000 and $50,000. You want to know why? A number of reasons why. But that high-end individual might just come in and grab something and buy it. Okay? So you need to have the high end. You need to have the low end. It's just that important. Okay? This is, this is just mathematical facts. Next, um, in addition to this range of pricing, you have to have something in your inventory that is non-wall art related, okay? Non-wall art related. And the reality is, is that a lot, of, a lot of what this pricing argument is centers around how do you get the most ROI, return on investment, on all of the activities that you're doing to market your business, whether it's going to a show and fair, whether it's a Facebook post, whether it's an email, whatever you're doing. And the fallacy that we fall into and, and, you know, the, the, the loop where this always happens, where I see it time and time and time again. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to post on Facebook. It's going to be a sale. And then I'm going to boost the post, and we'll see what happens. I'm just going to throw $100 at it. I'll throw $100 at it, see what happens. Anyone, anyone on this call done that before? And you're, you're in your mind, you're thinking, out of, those, out of that $100 that I spent on boosting that post on Facebook, Everyone that that ad reaches are all going to have their hand up saying, I'm ready to buy wall art right now. Nothing could be further than the truth. The vast majority of them are not ready to buy wall art right now. But maybe they like what you're doing. Maybe they like the creations that you have. Maybe they're not interested or not ready or not remodeling their house or about to move or whatever it is. And because you only have wall art for sale, they're leaving. They left. They didn't buy anything. But if you have something that's non-wall art related, all of a the sudden, they're like, I love what this person did. I'm going to go ahead and purchase this non-wall art related thing. And now that artist is going to remain top of mind. And now the easiest way to solve for the non-wall art is with merchandise of the various different stripes. Now, one of the things that I love and that I get pushed back on all the time is merch. Like, I'm going to sell merchandise and I can get into the various different types in a second. That is so cheesy, right? That is going to completely lower... Uh, 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 the notion people have of my business and make me seem like some sort of schlocky merchant because I'm selling merch. Okay, okay. Let me know the last time any of you went into a museum that didn't have a gift shop. Go ahead and let me know which one. I don't ever get a response on that one. They all have gift shops for a reason because they are businesses at the end of the day and that they need to, they need to get revenue, okay? And this is just a mathematical formula. Everyone likes to get involved in the, in, the, in the emotional aspects of it. It is just a mathematical formula. And when you have non-wall art, okay, you are capturing purchases in situations in which you otherwise would never be able to do so for all the people that are not ready to buy wall art. And I'm going to get into some more detail on this, but I don't even care what the non-wall art is. It can be calendars, it can be photo books, it can be stickers, it can be magnets, it can be yoga mats, cell phone cases, tote bags, throw pillows. I got a bunch of this stuff over here. Coffee cups. It doesn't matter what it is, but you need to get it into your lineup. When you take this business seriously, when you understand you are in it for the long term, you understand how the real world works. You sold somebody a tote bag or a coffee cup. Next thing you know, for the next five years, I am now drinking... Uh, a coffee every morning looking at your work. Then I'm ready to buy a $25,000 original. And because I had that coffee cup, because I've been lusting after that image for the last 10 years, I bought your work. That's how it works in the real world. That is how a business is built. And when you understand these things, you instantaneously bolt them into your business and you start winning. Okay? You start winning. And there are, there are and, and this is important, and this is how this whole thing tees up next. 
is there are only three ways to grow a business, okay? Three ways, that's it. Number one way, acquire new customers. This is what 99% of people focus on. How can I get more customers in the door? How can I get my art in front of more people? How can I acquire new customers? New, 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 okay? That's, what, that's number one way. And then number two way is you increase what we call AOV, your average order value. Now, everyone uses the same example for this. I rather like it. Ray Kroc, way back in the day, started out selling burgers. And let's just say the burgers cost 50 cents. And you either bought one burger, two burgers, or three burgers at four burgers at McDonald's, and you made 50 cents on each one. So the AOV, if you just bought a burger, was 50 cents. They all sat down and they had a meeting and they said, how are we going to increase the amount of cu money customers spend when they do see us, our average order value? And some guy goes, well, I've been working on these French fry things. Let's try those. And so then, in the early days of McDonald's, when you went up to buy a burger, they said, do you want fries with that? And that's how they increased the average order value from 50 cents a burger to 75 cents with the fries or whatever the costs were back then. So increasing the average order value is the second way to grow a business, okay? The third is to get repeat customers to come back and purchase again. Now, artists and photographers admittedly do a much better job at this than they do AOV. Almost no one focuses on AOV. But as long as I've been in this industry now and as closely as I've studied all of my, all of my data, customers coming back and purchasing again, i.e. your collector list, is literally one of the most predictive um, metrics for how well a business will do on how much revenue an art business can generate. This business and the nature of this business is you guys end up getting fans. Those fans turn into super fans and lots of them will buy seven to 10 to 20 pieces of your art over their careers. They just will. And that's, that's why these collectors need to be treated like they're staying at the Four Seasons. I go on rants about this all the time, but a collector list is a huge one. So if there's three ways to grow a business, acquire new customers, increase your average order value and get repeat customers to come back that is when this whole pricing thing stinks in. That is when this whole entire thing starts clicking and making so much sense. Because if you've been in this business for any period of time or any business, the easiest customer to get, number one, is the customer you already have, okay? It is much easier to get an existing customer to come back and purchase something again than it is to go out and acquire a new customer. So that is just fact. And so those are the three ways. And now let's look at that. Those are the three ways to grow an art business through the lens of how we have our newly established pricing, non-wall art, zero to 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 plus, right? So in terms of acquiring new customers, you will acquire new customers when you have that range of pricing. You will acquire new customers when you have non-wall art as a part of the lineup. Now let's talk about average order value. When you sell somebody a large print and you're able to ask them if they also want a calendar or if they also want a yoga mat or if they also want a mug or if they also want a photo book or a tote bag or whatever else, you have a very easy way with those lower priced items to increase the average order value of every single solitary sale you make, okay? Does damage there. Easiest customer to get is the one that you already have. And so when you're making these sales, and especially you're making these sales where you're making almost no money whatsoever, to the folks that are the lower end of the pricing scale, five to six to seven years down the line, because you are marketing consistently, those folks come back and they buy the expensive stuff. Or the people that are not ready to buy and make a huge buying commitment because they're just getting to know you now, because you purchased something uh, at the lower end of the scale that they're now carrying around with them or they now have in their house, you are top of mind when they're ready to make the purchase. This is all just maths. It's all just simple mathematics. And it can fundamentally change your business the minute, the minute that you bolt these things in. Those reasons alone are enough to get this type of a pricing model going on. And we're just getting started and we're just getting started, okay? The next, the next thing that I wanna talk about, okay, so we've talked about how we need to have these prices. We've talked briefly about how you achieve them. I'll go a little bit more into depth in terms of how you generate a lineup like this, how typically artists and photographers generate a lineup like this. For the prices under 100 bucks, obviously we've talked about merch. Uh, this is also why you need to be offering prints because the smaller paper prints uh, unmatted, unframed, you can offer for under $100. So it's very easy to do that with a combination of merch and smaller prints. Okay, great, under 100, nailed. 100 to 1,000, what do we do there? For most folks, these are your open edition paper prints. 
And then as you start getting a little bit higher up in the range, let's say 700, 800, 900, either you're a limited edition prints. So between the combination there, you can adjust a little bit depending on where you're priced currently. But combination of open editions, combination of limited editions, in some cases it can be some smaller originals, but that's usually how we hit the sweet spot of 100 to 1,000. Then over 1,000, is obviously your originals, your bigger originals. If you're a photographer, they can be bigger size pieces, they can be smaller limited editions, they can be one of four. You can get creative how you do it. Um, but that is a traditional way in how we nail those various different price points and, and, and get there, okay? And once you have that in place, so many things in your business will start making sense. So many things in your business will start clicking. You start contemplating these, these questions of self-doubt and how could I raise my prices and, and, and how can I get a return on my investment for time and materials and how do I charge what I'm worth? When you take the emotional nonsense out of that that all of us suffer with and you go right to a formula that just says this is maths and these are the boxes that I need to be in and tick, everything becomes easier. Everything becomes easier, which is wonderful. I want to talk about negotiation because this is tied directly to art as well, okay? Negotiation is absolutely, utterly, totally, and completely mandatory. Everybody negotiates, okay? Everybody negotiates. What artists and photographers read about all day long is the pieces that sold at Sotheby's or uh, Christie's for asking or over asking. And everyone thinks, whoa, look at that. Look at those incredible results. What you never hear about is what goes on in all the galleries. And the reason that you never hear about what goes on in all the galleries is because galleries are some of the most opaque institutions in the entire world. They don't ever tell anybody anything about what things actually truly and really sold for because they negotiate more than any other group of people I've ever seen on the face of the planet, okay? They negotiate on everything all the time. The higher the piece, the more negotiation goes down, okay? The reason that they don't publish it is they don't want anyone to ever know how hard they negotiate. It is one of the most opaque industries in the history of mankind. And, you know, there are three incredible podcasts on this, okay? So you can hear it out of someone's mouth other than mine. Do I have them on here? I think I do. So there's a book called Freakonomics. It's by an economist named Stephen Levitt, and it's really, really good. And he has this three-part podcast series. He calls the podcast Freakonomics um, about, about the art market, okay? And it goes into detail. He's interviewing the biggest galleries in the entire world, and it talks about essentially everything that I'm telling you on a, on a much deeper level. I'm going to send you all of this after the fact. I want you to read this, The Hidden Side of the Art Market, because he does a bunch of research present day and essentially is telling you all the same conclusions that I am, where the most opaque institutions, period, you've ever seen, and for a number of reasons. So what you need to know is that negotiation happens. What you also need to know is that there are a large number of people that will never purchase unless they get the satisfaction of knowing they negotiated you down. So when you don't negotiate, you just end up missing out on some portion of sales, period, end of sentence, because you did not negotiate and these people will only purchase when you negotiate. So negotiation is a very good idea. Negotiation is an extremely important part of art sales uh, and, and it's one that we all need to learn. It's a muscle, no different than anything else. And so you need to learn to get good at it, right? And so in order for us to, 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 to be able to understand negotiation and be good at negotiation, if we, if we come to terms with the fact that it's an integral part to art sales, that everyone does it, that it doesn't cheapen you uh, as the artist or does not cheapen the work, it is just a mathematical part of this business. Again, it's ones and zeros, no room for any emotion. Once you realize that as an artist or photographer, it is a very... It is a very freeing feeling. A weight is lifted off your chest because you know everybody wants to negotiate all the time. And not every time. Some people will give you full price sometimes, and that's great. But if they do want to negotiate and you realize that that is just part of a deal, you're in a great position. You are prepared for it, okay? Now, how do we prepare for it in terms of our now-known price points, our non-wall art, our mid-range prices, and our high-end prices? On the low end, $100 or less, you don't ever have to negotiate on that stuff. I mean, you can if you want to, but you know, the example I always use is I'm not gonna go into Target and try to negotiate them down on a set of Legos for my kids, okay? Not gonna do that, not happening, right? 
But when we get over 100, all the way up to the top end of your range, that's where the negotiation becomes real. Now, we know we're going to negotiate. We're excited about this. And so what do we do? We prepare ourselves for it. And we prepare ourselves for it by handling our markups ahead of time. Okay. Now, in terms of your prints, I recommend a 250% markup a 250% markup. So if the thing cost you 100 bucks, you are gonna mark it up 250%, you're gonna sell the thing for 350 bucks. Now, a 250% markup gives you plenty of room to come down on the price. It gives you plenty of room to come down on the price and not utterly, totally, and completely cannibalize your margins. So you can start at a 250% markup, you can go higher than that, you can play with it as you go. But we like, as a general rule of thumb, a 250% markup on your prints. The way to treat your originals is if you say to yourself, I really want to get $1,500 for this original, then, then charge $1,700 for it. Charge $1,700 for it or $1,800 for it and be prepared to negotiate down when, when the offer comes in. Now, the beautiful thing about this is like sometimes you raise the prices and it just sells and you're like, wow, I'm so glad I did that. That is just, that's just a great return on investment, fantastic. So that's an important thing to understand in the entire equation. The next portion of negotiation, okay, so now we've marked our things up correctly. We've marked our originals up correctly. We're prepared to negotiate if someone needs to negotiate. Artists and photographers are terrible at negotiating. I've said it. It's true. I've seen it. You guys will fold like a cheap suit at the quickest. I'm not going to give you retail price on that. Um, will you take this? Yeah, here, take it. There's, there's something that goes on that probably goes back to like our deep animal caveman heritage where you know unless you can get the thrill of a kill and it's not like a wounded animal or something like you're not happy you're gonna like pass it by or something there's something deep and like visceral about this but when people go into negotiations number one they want to negotiate and this is culturally way true for certain people more so than than americans at, at, at a macro i would say but there's certain people that just negotiate and that's just how it goes and they want to negotiate and they're not gonna buy unless they negotiate, but unless the negotiation feels like, a, 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 feels like this fight, this war to a certain extent, they'll, they'll either keep grinding you down or, or they just won't buy, period. And what do I mean by that? I mean like, hey, hey Emily, uh, I see this thing's 300 bucks. I don't have 300 bucks. Would you take 150 bucks for it? And Emily just goes, you know what? Yeah, okay. They're gonna be like, eh. Eh, no, no. Would you take 100? And you're like, are you kidding me? I just came down for half for you. This is ridiculous, right? So there's something psychological that goes on there that I don't fully understand. I'm sure there's studies I could find. The trick to negotiation, and there's a ton, but this one I think is, is something that served me well throughout my career, and I really believe in it is. In order for the negotiation to work, you can never come down on price without getting something in return, Okay. Negotiation is striking a bargain. I want you to come down on, I want you to give me something, and you say, okay, I'm going to get something in return. And now this is the room where we get really, really creative, okay? Because we know how the game of negotiation works, because we have our prices set correctly, because our markups are where they are, we can afford to negotiate creatively. What does that mean? Because we know negotiation is a mathematical formula in which there is no way I'm coming down on price unless I get something in return. Then we get to play the game, okay? And the game is just this. Let's say Philip here is, is in his booth, or he comes up to my booth, and I've got a piece for sale, and it's that print that cost me 100 bucks, and I marked it up to 350 bucks because my 250% markup. Philip comes in, he's like, Patrick, I really like this thing, um, but 350 is just a little steep for me right now. Would you take 300? And what I say to Philip is, well, Philip, I, I, I don't usually negotiate, but I'll tell you what. My car was pretty jam-packed getting to the show, and I would appreciate the space on the drive home. If you were willing to take the piece today, I'd come down to $300. Are you willing to take it today? And then you shut up. Philip's like, yeah, I'll take it today. Of course he's going to take it today. He was always going to take it today. That was the whole idea in the first place. But it doesn't matter. I made him agree to something, okay? There are numerous creative ways to do this. I say, Philip, I don't normally negotiate, but 
it depends on how you're going to pay. How are you going to pay? And Philip's like, I'll pay with credit card, cash, whatever you want. Okay. If you pay with cash, I'll do it. And then if he says, I'm going to pay with credit card, I say, oh, wonderful. Well, I was hoping it would go through credit card because I, I don't have change or anything. So if you pay with credit card, I'll take it, right? You can insert whatever nonsense you want, whether you need it or not in the negotiation, but make sure you have something. And when you prepare for this creatively ahead of time, what you will find is that your negotiations go significantly better because you understood this little trick. It's that simple. It's just that simple of a trick. So use that, get creative with it. I find it extremely effective. My final, okay, on pricing is when you have pricing set, when you have your markups in place, you have the ability to run sales. You have the ability to run sales all the time. And this is another one where folks are like, oh, running sales, it cheapens me, it cheapens my brand, it, you know, it, 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 it makes me feel like you know, some sort of schlocky merchant or whatever, whatever they might insert there. Human beings, as a species, okay, we need discounts plus scarcity to take action. Discounts plus scarcity to take action. The discount, 15% off. The discount, free shipping. The discount, you know, uh, BOGO, buy one, get one free. Whatever it is. The scarcity, deal ends Friday. Deal ends Sunday. Deal ends Saturday. Deal ends at midnight. You put those two elements in an equation, and what you do is you get an increased number of human beings willing to take action, okay? Willing to take action. The only two brands that I'm aware of that do not discount and run sales are Louis Vuitton and Tiffany's. Big brands anyway. I know there's some smaller brands that do. Louis Vuitton and Tiffany's. And these artists and photographers that come up to me and tell me I would never run a sale. It cheapens my work. And I say, so what you're telling me is that your brand is as sweet as Louis Vuitton or Tiffany's. Good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you, okay? You have to run sales. These are simple mathematics. They are just simple mathematics. But when you get everything set up, when you have your prices and you have your markups and you're asking, you're asking for more on your originals and you understand negotiation, when you have a sale in the water, okay, you are able to, to, to get sales that you wouldn't get otherwise. And by the way, you know, most would say we're already in a recession. Some wouldn't. Most would say challenging economic times. I live in California. The gas prices, good Lord. The sales become only more important when an economic climate is challenging. Because when price sensitivity is peaking and is at its highest, if you don't have that feel-good feeling of I got X on sale, you're likely not going to buy it. Especially in challenging economic times, which it looks like we're going to be in here for a hot minute. In addition to that, I would go as far to say that the success of art or photography businesses can come down to two things. One, at a macro, how consistent you do your marketing. But two important metrics, number of sales run per year and the size and health of the collector list. Those are the two most indicative individually elements of the equation that, that I can predict, accurately predict revenue for businesses. And we do this all the time. We have 7,400 or 7,800 customers now at art storefronts and I look at all their data and those are the two metrics that stands, stands out to me more than anything else. So last 48 hours, literally ended yesterday. Did it end yesterday? Yesterday, today's Friday, so it ended Wednesday maybe, I can't remember. The two biggest e-commerce days in the entire history of the United States. Are you aware that that just happened? Amazon Prime Day. Data just came in, two biggest days, e-commerce, single solitary 24-hour e-commerce sales periods in the history of this country, okay? What do we have all of our customers doing? Running Prime Day sales. Why? For all the reasons I just mentioned. Sales are a critical component of any art business. When you get these other big merchants spending a bunch of money on advertising, and chumming up the waters, get ready, X percent off, VIX percent off, all it does is charge up all of the dopamine in our heads and get us a little bit closer to our fingers being on that credit card. And so our customers ran sales and we saw some absolutely fantastic results. Absolutely fantastic results. And you know what? We're gonna have them do that 25 times this year on all of the various different holidays that are important 
and all of the times when these other merchants are spending all this money on advertising and it just works. So you have to be able to run sales. And when you have your markups, when you have your pricing in place, that is when it really, really works. And you know, one of the, one of the other things that I would say that once you nail this whole pricing thing, it, it, number one, it takes away like all of this fear about like how do I charge what I'm worth or how do I charge time and material, any of those like psychological things. But it also really dials in the business things because when you zoom out, when you zoom out and you're solving now instead of like what am I charging, what am I worth, time and material, somebody get me a calculator where I can do X times this and Y and square foot of canvas, all that is nonsense. All that matters is that you solve for this pricing equation. Once you do, you start thinking about your work completely different. You're like, what do I have that's gonna go into this box? What do I have that's gonna go into this box? What do I have that's gonna go into this box? So it solves a bunch of those psychological fears. But better still, you know, one of the most deflating things that we can have in this business is when some a-hole comes up and looks at something that you spent 40 hours on that you're charging $5,000 for, and they're like, that's awesome, I'll give you 500 bucks for it, right? When, some, when you get those insulting lowball offers, those types of things can derail you emotionally for a week sometimes. When you have the range of pricing, you can be like, okay, a-hole, that's wonderful that you have $500 to spend. Let me go ahead and show you what's in my $500 range. And you have it covered. You have the entire thing to cover. And what it actually does at the end of the day is those types of folks, and you know, sometimes they're not complete a-holes. They're, they're well-meaning, well-intentioned folks that just, you know, they just, they're doing what they're doing. But when you have the range, it eliminates a bunch of those knuckleheads because they see it, right? They can see from top to here and they're just like, okay, this is where I go, this is what I'm doing, this is where, this is where I land, right? So it, it helps out significantly in that capacity. And yeah, it just solves a bunch of problems. So I'm trying to think if there's anything I didn't cover in all of that. Yeah, that's pretty much my rant on pricing. I hope you guys found that helpful. Um, there was a couple of questions in there. Yeah, so Matt was asking about um, tax, shipping, handling. Yeah, you can 100% insert any of those in there at any point in time, right? Like when you're negotiating up or down, um, that's that's just how it goes. So that's that's like the kind of the way to approach it. It doesn't even matter what it is. You can you can just get creative on 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 absolutely any of it, right? Um, yeah, and Matt was also saying this type of pricing structure will also make it easier for organizations and corporations to potentially want to work with you and promote your work using accommodate broader audience range. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it just works on all fronts. And like, look, I realize that it's a lot and like everyone's looking at that and they're like daunted, like they're like, how the heck am I going to get there? You don't have to get there overnight, but it's, it's a very, very effective framework and it will, it will do such good and it will take away, I mean, for a lot of people, you know, again, you've been doing this for a while, pricing and how to price and how to charge what they're worth is paralyzing paralyzing by which i mean they'll like ruminate and stew and marinate on these things for like months and years in some cases and it's like when you have the equation you're just like oh all right these are the boxes i want to go fit stuff in and then when you're creating sometimes you're like okay i'm gonna create uh uh, uh for this for, for this side of the equation as well so that's how i like to look at it that's how i like to approach it um i think it's extremely beneficial and it's just as beneficial, you know, when you, when you contemplate doing it at a show or a fair, right? Like, you know, to maximize one's ROI at a show or a fair, when you have that pricing range there, oh, it's cooking with gas. Um, works just as well, of course, um, you know, when you do, when you're doing it online as well. And Kat was asking, she has glass. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, you have to get creative. On some, some niches out there, you really do have to get creative on how you create the items that fit into those various different boxes. Um, and again, you know, we, we have some customers that, that really have a hard time doing it. Like, you know, we have, we have a gal that just signed up recently and I had a phone call with her. I'm actually curious to go, I gotta go track her down, see what she's doing. Her art is like bead art, you know? And like each piece has like 10,000 beads on it. And it looks amazing in person, but you can't, you can't really, it doesn't really translate to prints at all, right? So she has to get creative in some of the other ways that she's doing it. But at the end of the day, it's just maths. It's literally just mathematics. So it doesn't even matter what the it is, uh, as long as you have something with your work on it that gets there. So yeah, you gotta get creative. And, and you know, Kat, you can, you can play with prices, of course. 
right? And 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 that one's easy to do. But again, the work's got to sell. We can never forget the work's got to sell. But that is that is my long form rant on pricing. I hope you guys got some value out of that. I do like ranting on it. Um, but what else? Questions, comments, concerns from any of you, Cameron folks, or or to anyone else? Yeah, all right, Emily, I see it. I see it. You you can kick us off. Hold on, I gotta unmute you. <laughs> Go ahead. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. I want to thank you. Um, you I have, you know, I've been preparing to launch my website. Yep. I'm this close, mm -hmm. but uh, in preparation for that, and what you've said over and over again every time I've joined these calls is to raise my prices so that I can have sales. Yeah. Well, last weekend I went to an event and I had raised my prices in preparation for launching my web page, mm -hmm. and. I had a piece originally when I painted it, I put it at like six twenty five, something like that. Okay. I was like, no, 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 no. I definitely it's it's worth more than that. I bumped it up to seven twenty. I had it at seven twenty forever. Mm -hmm. And then in preparation for my page launch, I said, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and bump this up to eight fifty. I took it with me to an event last weekend. So done. No negotiation at all, just boom. Yeah. No, yeah. no negotiation. Yeah. yeah. And I actually had that was my uh even without that sale, that ended up being my best event I've ever had. So that's pretty badass. Boom. And thank you. Um, I hit 1,000 followers on Instagram this week, there too. You go. So it's been a big week. There you go. <laughs> that's, how, that's, that's how it starts. That's how it starts. Yeah. Cool. But I don't know. I just want to let you know that uh, it was your inspiration that made me raise my prices. And then I ended up having my nice big sale this, uh, this weekend. So yeah. thanks a lot. It works. And I'm, I'm like, close to launching my site so good good are you signing are you signing up with us or are you doing it on your own i am. oh and it hasn't been easy yeah so <laughs> yeah. but no i'm good on man yeah yeah all good all good you'll that you'll... is how it's it's share of frustrations but that's got that's neither here nor there so yeah it's all, it's, it's it's all good you're you, 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 what makes me happy is you're taking the advice and you're running with it and you're seeing results so that yep. makes me really really happy I'm also Thank you. I'm also working right now full disclosure on you know I just I just finished the pricing guide. I could even tease this. Can I tease it? Do I have it? Where is it? Oh yes. Boom, scroll all the way up to the top. The ultimate guide to successful art shows and theirs. I'm doing full tactical on this thing. I mean, I I I haven't like the pricing one was really really good and I got a ton of like amazing feedback on that and so I'm like, okay, I gotta do, I gotta do the ultimate guide to shows and theirs, and it, you know, it builds on the pricing thing um, as well, which is really, really nice. So anyway, you guys will, you guys will see this um, in email. In, in oh, I realize I'm not sharing my screen. Good work, Bozo. The ultimate guide to successful art shows and theirs. Anyway, I'm working on this thing now. It should be out next week. Um. All right. And Derek's asking if there's a recording. I, st I streamed it to Facebook and I streamed it to YouTube, so you'll be able to find it after the fact on either. Um, I don't think I record. I, I didn't record it um, internally, so um, yeah, that's wrong on that's wrong on that. Um, but who else, guys? Questions, comments, concerns on the Friday? Why I'm here? Why you've got me? One of the fun things I can say we're doing right now. Yep, I got you, Les. And let me make my announcement and then I'll grab you next, Les, is like, look, if you've just found out about us or just got sucked into our ecosystem, don't worry about it. We're not going anywhere. But if you're like, these guys might know what they're talking about, they probably can really help us out. Um, you know, one of the one of the interesting things that we're doing right now is we realize that they're tough economic times, inflation and everything else. And so if you sign up, I think it's like in the next week, we will 100 percent build the entire website for you from start to finish. You don't have to do any of it, not touch a single solitary thing. All you have to do is put a folder with your images, your titles, uh, and we build the entire thing, which is not something we usually do. So that's kind of exciting. Um, but go ahead, Les. Still need yeah. that. Yep, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, okay, I, I, I just had a, a question about um, order fulfillment and what kind of analytics you have about order fulfillment. Uh, if, if I'm using your website mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, reports, analytics, you know, that kind of thing, what, what do you have available there? Yeah. I mean, 
we have a the whole back end that like sort of merges part accounting software, part inventory management, part normal data analytics. So everything that you would expect is in there. But what what metric are you are you trying to drill into specifically? Just, uh, like just you know, I mean, sales for an item, maybe you know, sales over a quarter or sales by. Uh, let's say catalog or mm -hmm. or class, you know, just just so there's a way to to look at those. Or or for instance, uh, I'm I'm looking at photography, and so if there are prints, I mean, mm -hmm. th uh, there are some original photos, but most of most of my business I would probably be prints. Um, you know, the different sizes, for instance, of you know, framed or unframed, mounted, matted, unmatted, that that kind of thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, I would I would probably sooner bounce it to spreadsheets myself and do it that way i mean I, I find like anytime somebody alleges to have like a really good data dashboard that's gonna like show me pretty pictures and graphs they usually don't i think we're probably along the same lines like we have the basic stuff but it's not going to be like the pretty pictures and everything else that, that you want so i would just bounce the spreadsheets and probably manipulate the data that way i would say like even with every single solitary marketing service that we use as a company almost all of it still has to get bounced to a sheet sadly none of the data charts are even that good sort of an annoying disconnect we have in today's world. It just is. But the good news is, is less, those dashboards only really become impressive when you're selling thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. Solve that problem first and then worry about the data after the fact, right? Fair enough. Yeah. That's Thank kinda, you. That's kind of how I like to slice it, yeah. Um, ch 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 yeah, there's a bunch. Matt just just request a demo. Matt's asking to see like, you know, examples of our websites. They're they're all pretty similar in all honesty, and they're all very simple. And they're all minimalist, and they're all that way for a reason. You know, websites in a macro what 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 where artists and photographers go wrong is and and <laughs> every every once in a while, every once in a while like myself, my team will get you know, he or she who's closest to the customer always wins, right? So we'll get a bunch of people that have submitted demo requests um, and we'll get their email and we have a little service that shows us what their social sites are and so we know what their website is. And we'll look at all their websites, right? All the websites that they built on these various other different services and everything else. And almost all of them are the same. And almost all of them are a disaster. And they're not a disaster because they don't look beautiful. They 100% look beautiful. That's one thing that artists and photographers usually spend all the time in the world on nailing. They're all disasters because they don't understand how art and photography is sold. Any time we're contemplating how art and photography is sold, especially when it comes to a website, especially in a digital capacity, you have to realize you're not reinventing the wheel, okay? There is a way art and photography has been sold for centuries, and it's an insanely effective way. And what is it? It's in art galleries. It's in art galleries. And when you go into an art gallery, what's one thing you notice? They're all pretty much the same. They have white walls, maybe some nice furniture, and nothing else. And that reason for that is so that the art is front and center, and there's nothing there to distract you whatsoever. White walls, the work popping off of it, right? Okay, let's use that example then for, for artists and photographers' websites that they build on their own. Goofy shit all over the place. Moving slideshows, 27 different colors, giant images blown up, uh, uh, s s rotating things and everything else. And it's like, what are you doing? All you're doing is distracting me from even getting close to purchasing anything. You want minimalist. You want simple. And you want the online experience to mimic as closely as possible that experience that you get when you walk into a real art gallery. So... That's what I would say on that. Um, but now, if you request a demo, they'll walk you through it. They'll show you a bunch of different examples. Um, and I think you'll find it you'll find it really, really helpful. And David, the YouTube stream, just search Art Storefronts on YouTube. Um, it'll come up and you'll see it. There'll be live broadcasts. Um, yeah, image licensing. Image licensing is sort of, he's asking, what about image licensing for photographers? That's sort of a different ball of wax. Um, I don't think, and I might as well unmute you, David. I don't think that that, that business has quite the the you know the wind in its sails that it once used to. It's a little bit harder to do that in today's day and age. And why do I why do I say that? 
I say that to say if you're one of the lucky ones that gets a licensing deal over the line, don't negotiate too damn hard. Take the deal because in my experience, not many are getting that revenue source. Um, anyway, that's, 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 that's in my experience, but follow up on it. And you're unmuted, David. We can hear you. Oh, you mean follow up on the question? Yeah. I mean, are you getting are you getting those types of inquiries? Currently? Yeah, not as much as I want. Yeah. Um, the um, so one of the things I was wondering is if I were to use art storefronts, mm -hmm. but just want to use it to sell image licenses, is it set up to be able to handle that sort of thing? Yeah, a hundred percent, you can. But I, I I think I'd be worried for you if you did that. And I, I wouldn't be worried for you for doing that in the sense that like our software couldn't handle it. I would be worried for you in the sense that I don't think that's a viable business model. I think the mm -hmm. odds of you making it just licensing images, unless you have some serious tricks up your sleeve or a long history of relationships, uh, is is no different than you know the basketball player making it to the NBA. In my experience, it's like, interesting, and, and the reason I brought it up in the context of this pricing mm -hmm. dissertation is that I've sold image licenses for, uh, let's see, probably anywhere from $25 to at least 400. And I think I may have sold one for more than that mm -hmm. for a single use image license. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of tough for me to know where to put the pricing because some people can't tolerate more than 10 or 20 bucks. And I'm not interested in those clients that tends to be art consultants who want to do the framing and printing and framing and all that themselves yeah and they just go to a stock photo place and they're not interested in paying no. more for a license no they're not i mean sadly you know i'm 43 years old and 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 been super into photography for a long time and sadly the image licensing business is going the way of blockbuster video and mm. the reality is is that too many cameras too many images from too many people willing to sell them too cheap and so i think the w where i worry for you is thinking that you're going to ever make anything appro approaching a decent living because the number of people you know if you had a store that rented vhs tapes like yeah you might get some business every once in a while or even mm. dvds every once in a while but like it, it's only going to further decline and further decline and further decline. So if, if the idea is, is that you generally do want to earn some revenue off of your photography, I believe that you selling the prints direct, you know, you, you, you are going to 100x your income potential by focusing on that without cannibalizing the licensing at all. Like you can keep the licensing going, but you know, if, if you're going to maybe earn $1,500 a year, why would you go that route, right? It just, it's just an extremely, extremely um, low probability of success business at this juncture. Appreciate your thoughts. Yeah. I wish it wasn't the case. I mean, we have, we have so many, so many photographers that have these like huge, incredible, out of control archives. And if you look at the business over the last like 20 years, like, you know, back pre-digital when it was film and slides, it was pretty good. It was awesome. And then those first digital cameras came on the scene and it cost much cheaper to make a photo. And then everyone in the entire world had like a really good camera on their pocket and the whole thing is just, and I just don't see it coming back. So it's, it's, it's the nature of the beast. Things, things change and things evolve. Um, but it's okay though. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's selling the image is selling the image, right? Like what you're trying to do is sell the image. So yeah, there you go. Um, but what else guys, questions? Questions? Or do we want to wrap up the Friday? I'll send you, I'll send you after the fact, certainly the video that I would have normally played, which does a good job explaining what, what I normally explain on these things, which is, you know, what we do as a business, how we think you need to be thinking about it at a high level. We certainly covered some of those things, uh, al al although certainly not all of those things. So I think you guys will find that helpful. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed mixing it up on a Friday and, you know, that the highlight of my day, the fact that David called it a dissertation. That's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going, I'm, I'm literally, I'm gonna crack a beer and just like, dissertation! Didn't even know I had one of those in me. Um, 
but seriously, I'm flattered by that. Not kidding, David, despite the fact I'm, you know, I'm making a cheeky joke about it. Um, but I am proud of that pricing article, and I do think it'll solve. I, I think it'll solve a lot of woes. And you know, the old, the most important thing is the work's got to sell. The work's got to sell, right? And Lee, I'm not going to pick on you, or Les, I'm not going to pick on you, but perfect example, right? Like, don't worry about the order analytics. Worry about whether or not the work sells. Only thing that matters. I usually like, you know, it w the other example is we run sessions like this, and I, and I mean it, Les, I don't mean to pick on you. Everyone does this. Um, you know, m my customers, and we'll, we'll, we'll be teaching them how to run the Prime Day sale, right? And so it'll be a Zoom session like this. We have a bunch of our customers. We're walking through all the tactical things they need to do for their Amazon Prime Day sale. And they want to talk to me about their analytics, right? They want to talk to me about their analytics on, on reels and how many visits are getting back to their website and how many likes and comments and shares. And it's like, do you remember what Picasso said? The work must sell. It must go out into the world. There is no button on the ATM machine for likes, comments, shares. Everybody tells me my work is great. I was in a juried show. And the reason that there's no button on the ATM machine for any of that, because they're not sales. That Picasso quote is just so damn chock full of wisdom. It is insane to me. And it's very easy to be working in this business, on this passion, you know, and you feel like you're really doing a bunch of stuff and you feel like you're really busy and you're accomplishing a bunch of things and what you're working on makes zero difference to the bottom line and never will. It never will. So we always have to remember the work must sell. It must go out into the world. We also must remember just because it's not selling doesn't mean you're a crappy artist or a photographer. It just means whatever you're working on at this moment is not something the market wants. That is a reality, okay? It's a game of archery. You're not going to hit the bullseye every single solitary time you fire an arrow. So understand it's how many arrows you fire, okay? It's how many arrows you fire. So once we have that sorted, have our pricing sorted, doing our marketing consistently, we're cooking with gas. I'll send you guys a follow-up email. As I said, I don't really do sales pitches on here, but if you're, if you're on the fence and you're like, this is interesting, these guys know what they're talking about, you should definitely get a demo. The fact that, you know, we build the website for you at this juncture is crazy. We've never offered that for free, ever, I don't think. Um, normally they charge a bunch of money for it, but the fact that you can sign up and you don't even have to freaking, you know, build the website at all, they build it for you is pretty insane. Um, there are request demo buttons all over the website. I'll, I'll get you a link now. I should have this ready, but it's on a Friday. Um, hold on. And what happens too, I should, I should say is that you request one of these things and they set up a, they set up a, um, and by the way, Sammy Davis just left a comment. I have to know, I have to know if you literally got that name because your, your parents were big fans. I'm unmuting you, Sammy. I want to know. Were your parents big fans of Sammy Davis or did they just like the name? He might be at work. He's not unmuting. But anyway, I want to hear about that. Um, you can just click the form in the chat, or there's there's demo request buttons all over the site, or they'll be in the, the follow-up email my team sends you after the fact. Um, what else was I saying? Yeah, Sammy Davis. Ah, awesome. He said, yes, they were. How, do you, how are you not a Sammy Davis fan? I mean, that guy was, I mean, notwithstanding his voice, he just looked like the happy, like, great personality person I've ever I've ever seen. I am, I am, a, I am a Sammy Davis Jr. fan, without question. Um, so that's awesome. It's an awesome name, man, and that's that's probably going to have to help with the uh, with the art sales. I mean, who doesn't want to see Sammy Davis signed in the corner? I certainly do. But all right, guys, we'll leave it there. Thanks for thanks for hanging on the session. I hope you guys learned some cool stuff. Don't get emotional about the pricing thing. Trust me, use this matrix. Your lives are all going to get significantly easier. Uh, you, you, you're going to be prepared to negotiate. Uh, you're 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 going to be uh, you know you're going to be cooking with gas. You're going to be cooking with gas. So that's what I would say. Um, great weekends all hope to see you on a future session or on the inside raise your prices again Emily and uh, yeah have great weekends all, all right